Many of you have likely heard the assertion by women that if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Now, if someone were to trace this quote back to its creator, I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out to be a rationalization by a woman higher in the dark tetrad, that is, narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, and sadism. The goal here being to get the man to adopt the mindset that they are supposed to not only deal with, but tame women's chaotic and antisocial behaviors. There are multiple reasons I think this is the case, which we'll get into in this video, along with a particular fallacy men are susceptible to, which sets them up for failure in all this. As I've been saying, women have heavily relied on plausible deniability to conceal the reality of their behavior. However, today too much evidence has stacked up shedding light on this, so they are losing leverage. This likely in part also has to do with the more recent decline in men seeking relationships on the whole. Even if not having endured it themselves, by being exposed to the countless accounts by men detailing women's sadistic behavior, as well as considering the current law system when it comes to marriage and even interactions with women in general, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that they decide to check out. The interesting finding that individuals higher in the dark triad select for short as well as long-term partners that facilitate a drama-rich environment was the first thing that came to mind regarding the idea that men need to handle women at their worst. Women have a tendency to plant self-serving bits of information preemptively with men in the hope they stick. They furthermore will use precarious masculinity wherein they redefine masculinity in accordance with what they find to benefit themselves at a particular time in their lives. You can imagine the older woman who, after spending years having fun and not prioritizing a long-term relationship, vehemently asserts that real men date women their own age. This is yet another use of language as a means to an end endeavor in eliciting a certain emotional response, with the goal being to shift the priorities of men her age who work to acquire resources and status to prioritize her and women like her, despite the fact that she squandered the main resource that these men find desirable in a woman to begin with. In the case of our original example, by getting men to adopt the idea that they are not worthy or masculine if they don't put up with a woman's likely sadistic and abusive behaviors, as is common today, this aids women higher in the dark tetrad with acquiring as well as maintaining partners regardless of how badly they treat them. This furthermore parallels with Sadia Khan's assertion that when women are in love, they play stupid games which, in my eyes, comes down to yet another attempt at getting men to not only accept, but further pursue women who engage in manipulative behaviors, likely herself included. Karen of the Happy White School channel has stated some interesting things on this topic of manipulation in her videos including the following. Here's the thing we need to realize as women is that we say that we want a strong, confident man who will stand up to us and not let us act out in our emasculating women ways or toxic femininity behaviors. The truth is, is that when a man actually stands up and is confident in himself and stands up to us, we use it against them. It is how as women we are duplicitous, meaning we say we want one thing, but then we act and do something very different that is contradictory. We tell ourselves and society that we want a strong man so we feel safe in his masculine nature. And then when that same strong man reacts in his manly ways towards our emasculation, we point the finger out at them and we blame them. We manipulate our husbands by provoking them on purpose to elicit negative reactions so that then we can point the finger at them and blame them for the issues and the problems in the relationship. It is one of the sneakiest, covert, and cruel forms of emasculation. It's a trap. Interestingly, she has also stated that men should get to a point wherein the woman's abusive behaviors don't affect him and that there are lessons to be learned through such treatment. Now, while she may genuinely believe this, what also comes to mind is Vaknin's explanation that narcissists reframe their abuse, as he states, as tough love, actually I'm doing it for you, it's for your own good, I'm educating you, I'm edifying you, I'm growing you up, I'm helping you to develop. I am training you to survive in a hostile world, etc, etc. Abuse, according to him, can also be viewed as a reaction to the partner's behavior and even as a test of loyalty. Of course, regardless of the post hoc rationalization formed in the woman's mind, the behavior is still abuse. 
There will also be women who purposely make similar assertions, given that it may provide them plausible deniability, a facet of dissocial personality disorder, as explained in a previous video. As I've observed, women will employ this form of precarious masculinity to keep men playing their sadistic games of their own accord, ultimately providing them with a preferred drama-rich environment, and furthermore, resulting in men directly facilitating women's hypoagency in the matter when it comes to their antisocial behaviors. The end result being men normalizing women's clearly abusive behaviors as some form of obstacle they need to overcome, yet, as I've previously talked about, likely having short as well as long-term consequences on their psychological health. The biggest benefit of the doubt I could give here comes down to how inclined people are in general to post hocly rationalize their inherent drives. In this case, a sadistic woman, regardless of how aware she is of this trait, would default to rationalizing ways of satiating said drive. In comparison to others, however, she would have to know on some level she is sadistic, and research has shown that this is generally realized at an early age, so there are no excuses for this. Now, where men fail in this is that they can be prone towards not only buying women's self-serving definitions of what constitutes a quote-unquote real man, but the naturalistic fallacy which, by definition, is the idea that what is found in nature is good. This is where you end up with assertions by men, such as women are supposed to essentially be abusive towards them, and that men more or less need to man up and mold themselves to take and overcome this abuse, a mindset permitting women to satiate their desire for drama as well as sadism. In nature, cancer is also natural, but as we know it can end us, as with abusive women, again a potential contributor to men passing earlier on average, it only makes sense to remove it, or better yet, take preventive measures to not acquire it in the first place. In both cases, education being key here, as opposed to listening to salespeople who don't have your best interests in mind. In the case of the former, women as well as those who have financial interests, and as for the latter, the food as well as medical industry. Women will exploit this tendency in men as a means to justify their antisocial behaviors as well as satiate their sadistic drives, which reminds me of a particular interaction I had with a rather impulsive, seemingly psychopathic woman. In explaining some of my views of the world early on, wherein she was attempting to gauge me, I stated that I don't necessarily believe in free will. This comment was met with a smirk as well as her stating that she can't control her behaviors. As I've stated before, a woman smirking or grinning is commonly a marker, generally not hidden, of her engaging in some form of manipulative behavior and found in literature as duping delight, which you will be able to read more about in my upcoming book, Manipulation to a One, Self-Preservation for a Dark Triad World. In this case, an attempt at getting me to view her antisocial tendencies as something she had no control over at all, and therefore justifying it. Now, while on some level this inability to control her behavior is likely true, and parallels one in-person lecture with Dr. Sam Vakden, where he stated that he knows beforehand that he will end up engaging in the same behaviors, he has also touched on narcissistic behavior being a choice. The example he used being the one time his narcissism shut off, in jail. This was because if he didn't change, well, he probably wouldn't be alive. Women openly, as well as covertly, engage in a plethora of dark tetrad behaviors today as they have no fear of consequences, physical or otherwise, so they run sadistically rampant. This is why part of men's flaw in all of this, the tendency to directly facilitate women's antisocial behavior through hypoagency and infantilization, is the naturalistic fallacy as, although there may be evolutionary components at play here, a subject I've hypothesized on in multiple videos over the years, it completely ignores the fact that humans can adapt. And women will never have an incentive to adapt if their current drives are being met through men's viewing of them as objects as opposed to agents in their antisocial acts. Instead, the rationalization is generally something along the lines of, well, that's just how they are, so man up, get used to it, and continue to pursue. In fact, get married even. If you watch the Daily Wire video, this was part of the sentiment permeating the conversation, with a particular segment I recall being that of Matt Walsh asking what the alternative is, and that by not electing to pair with someone, you are choosing despair. The obvious alternative is, and again to use the cancer analogy, removing anything conducive to what is detrimental to your life, and today that is relationships. 
Another instance comes to mind wherein one woman knew I studied the relationship between men and women, and after my briefly going into how relationships don't work, insisted on asserting that women, according to her, just want peace. This was interesting as it's exactly what men state, and in observing her engage in manipulative acts with a smirk on her face on multiple occasions, it became rather apparent that she was regurgitating what men say, seemingly yet another instance of a woman attempting to keep as many men within the mating pool for resources as well as sadistic and or masochistic supply purposes, this time by attempting to establish a false sense of possessing common interest. And the interesting part about this is the fact that the more interactions men have with women, the more their heads will be filled with such false pieces of information. It truly is an interesting state of affairs, one that has so much money tied to it, that it wouldn't surprise me that at least some of the disingenuous takes online regarding how men should continue to pursue relationships comes down to not only attempts at plausible deniability, but as was the case with media outlets pushing the jab, certain parties being paid off. Just as companies hire researchers to generate studies demonstrating their product has positive effects, individuals as well as groups will be paid off to push certain narratives. Likely at some point, RP content producers who have amassed a rather large following, as most people have a price. In this sense, it's all about the bottom line of various industries, and women are along for the ride as they desire men's resources as well as perpetual sources of sadistic supply, amongst other things. These parties will adapt their strategies as they see fit and will lie through their teeth to get what they want. Man, the untapped resource, continuing to be exploited and led astray to play the game.